today we uh, are very privileged and to welcome Eugene Marshall from Arcanus Press to talk about uh, their their latest publication, Ancestry and Culture: An Alternative to Race in Five E. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, I uh, I actually use this this module in a game that we're playing, uh, a vampire D&D game that we call What We D&D in the Shadows, and it's really fun, and I'm very excited uh, to introduce Eugene. And without further ado, uh, let's go on over to them. Uh, hello, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor uh, and uh, quite a fun opportunity to talk about this stuff with you all. Um, so uh, as Tatiana suggested, my name is Eugene Marshall. My pronouns are he, him, or they, them. Uh, I am the co-owner of Arcanist Press. Uh, I guess what I thought I'd start with today is just give you a brief overview about my history and what led to this product that is the topic of today, and talk a little bit about why this is uh, a necessary, I think, I you know, a problem to address, and that my uh, title here might how it tries to solve a certain sort of problem, uh, or maybe more uh, appropriately, how it I try to invite people to think about how they can solve the problem for themselves. Uh, the, the subject matter is uh, the topic of race in Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that's the kind of larger subject matter. So I, like uh, quite a few people, uh, have been playing Dungeons and Dragons for a long time. I got into it as a kid, people of my, of my age, I guess, uh, watching the cartoon in 1982, three, got the Red Box uh, basic edition book when the cartoon was on TV and uh, they, it was featured in movies like E.T. Uh, and I played and I didn't, when I was growing up as a white Midwestern uh, male, I didn't think anything of the content really. I mean, I was much more engrossed with uh, the dragons and the adventure and the imagination and the collaborative storytelling and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and so I was very much in that mode and played up and through into college and grad school and marriage and children. I ended up drifting away from it, but came back in 2014 when the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons came out. And uh, I, uh, you know, again, just dove right back into it. But, you know, I could, it was mostly a kind of a nostalgic experience. But uh, while uh, playing over the subsequent few years, you know, I would read online people talking about the game and their experience with it. And, you know, I grew up in a very, you know, was, I grew up in suburban St. Louis and my neighborhood, St. Louis is quite uh, uh, fairly uh, divided uh, on, ra on lines of race and ethnicity. So I always went to a very kind of, lived in a very kind of dominant white neighborhood, went to almost all white people in my school, et cetera. And so I didn't, uh, you know, have an opportunity to, for example, sit down and play Dungeons and Dragons with a person of color or, uh, uh, I mean, frankly, it was all young white guys, right? There's the whole group, really. There was like, one Asian American in the group that I played with occasionally, and that was it. Um, so uh, it just, the, and I was clueless. So the idea is that there might be something uh, problematic about the way races are represented in Dungeons and Dragons and role-playing in general wasn't uh, on my radar as a kid. Uh, but when I returned as an adult, a uh, post-grad school and all that, I started to become aware of oh, this is kind of a tropey shorthand and they're using it just because this is like, you know, to make it easier for storytelling and because it's this nostalgic throwback. But I was by this time aware that a lot of the things that the NG was throwing back to, so to speak, Tolkien, Lovecraft, were, had all kinds of problematic content in them. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but so I was aware of this. And so when I was running my own games, I would kind of homebrew that out, right? So in my world, you know, these various uh, peoples were any sentient creature has, you know, the capacity for uh, culture and speech and uh, good or evil or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> so there was no kind of, I tried to avoid kind of like painting on an entire race of people as savages deserving of death and all that sort of nonsense. Uh, but, and that was all I really did about it. I just kind of like removed it from my own play at my table and that was that. But last year, uh, so two years ago, I started getting into game design, happened to be playing a game with someone who themselves was a designer, an artist and a designer. And they ended up inviting me to, to 
contribute to something and it that grew into regular contributions to their uh, press, Sigil Entertainment, that's Aaron Acevedo. And uh, he uh, kind of got me into that. And so there I was designing for games. And then I started reading essays. I'd encounter blog posts uh, about talking about the issue of race in Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy in general. And really calling to my attention how problematic it was. It was kind of, I was always aware that it was kind of a simplistic, tropey shorthand, right? Uh, to kind of appeal to certain sorts of, what do you call it? Um, kind of like archetypes, monstrous archetypes or whatever. And I knew it was kind of lazy storytelling, but it didn't quite strike, I didn't quite realize how problematic it could be until I, these other people started pointing this out. So just, I wanted to share, I just point, give credit to those people. Uh, real quick. So for example, I just wanted to point out here, one great example of this is, I'm going to show you on my screen, an essay by the great uh, fantasy author N.K. Jemison. So this was written in 2013, and uh, it's titled The Unbearable Baggage of Orking. And uh, Jemison reports that uh, encountering uh, the representation of orcs in fantasy literature and games because she is a gamer herself, uh, you know, what really bothered her, right? Um, you know, she said that she, it, was, it bothered her how orcs were represented in Tolkien and Warhammer and, of course, D&D &D here, right? She, uh, she talks about how they are represented as creatures that are, represent kind of this evil other that are, there's nothing really for them uh, but to be slaughtered, right? They don't look like, they, they look like people, but they aren't really, they're kind of sort of people, right? They aren't worthy of the most basic moral considerations like the right to exist. The only way to deal with them is to control them utterly via slavery or wipe them all out. Huh, she says, sounds familiar. So then, and she then goes on to describe how that's, that's why she's not interested in writing about orcs and how that really kind of prevented her from fully enjoying games where, orcs are represented that way. It's not that the authors of those fantasies necessarily thought orcs stand in for blacks or Asians or some other ethnic group or race. It's just that they were the worlds involved uh, painting entire sentient races of creatures as subhuman. And you know, this is this, and when I started reading that, you know, and that was one of the places I encountered it in James Mendez Hode's a series of articles. This was last January, about the time I started thinking about this, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now. And uh, Mendez here has a great uh, series of essays on uh, how orcs were used in Tolkien and in the fantasy Tolkien was drawing from uh, as a stand in for uh, kind of. Uh, the fear of the Asian hordes and this sort of thing, right? He talks about this, uh, you know, orcs are squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow-skinned, wide mouths and slant-eyed, uh, a degraded and repulsive version of the two Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. That's Tolkien. Um, and, you know, they, there are other great articles. Here's Graham Barber on decolonization and integration in D&D. And he points out uh, the fact that in Dungeons and Dragons, there are People, there are these different races like orc and elf and human, and sometimes they interbreed. And but the you always refer to the offspring as half what they're not human. So they're not called half human or human orc or something like that. They're called half orc, and they're not called half human. They're called half elf, right? And so this emphasis on the way in which you are impure or fail to be human is kind of there's a history there uh, that that kind of way of thinking about racial mixture is has a long problematic past. And of course, also humans are the only people that can uh, intermix with these people. There are no creatures that are half elf, half orc. They are only half human, half orc, and half human, half elf. So as he puts it, if they don't look like us, we either want to have sex with them or kill them. Um, so these are just some examples of the things I was reading that made it clear to me that some people, um, that this is, that there's lots of kind of uncomfortable content actually in Dungeons and Dragons that I was, that wasn't visible to me. Uh, originally. And these authors were 
thankfully were decided to do the work of pointing it out to the public, including me. And so, but once I kind of saw that, I couldn't unsee it, right? And so then when going back to playing Dungeons and Dragons or uh, uh, watching a movie or a video game or reading a book, it became just so much more obvious. Like my, I have a, one of my sons was reading uh, one of the, uh, he had found one of my old from when I was a high school kid, uh, R.A. Salvatore books, Dritz de Orden is this figure. For, these are kind of like Dungeons and Dragons books. And in it, there's a scene where, uh, and to Salvatore's credit, I guess he, he draws the, your attention to the problematic nature of this, where they fight some orcs. And then after they've defeated, killed the orcs, they come across babies or children. And they one of the characters is just like, well, they're orcs, they're evil. And the, the protagonist, Dritz de Orden, is like, that's horrible. We're not going to know, right? And was op opposed to this. But I, as a growing up, I immediately recognized, oh, well, that's of course what a lot of people that I would have seen happen at the gaming table. People would have just been like, well, we need to kill them all. Or the minute you take a, you know, orcs are not for, you don't take them prisoner. You don't try and re, you know, uh, uh, reform them. They are to be killed. That's what we're, you know, that's what they're to do. And I, you know, I, I don't want to go into great length about this because I don't want to this talk to kind of devolve into some sort of uh, critique of just slamming on Dungeons and Dragons. I, st I still play it. I still enjoy it. There's still, it's a, there's a great, many great uh, communities around it, the game, and there's lots of uh, goodness there too. But, you know, even its creator, Gary Gygax, uh, regularly kind of, inf you know, endorsed some of this bad stuff. I remember I have, uh, if anyone really wants receipts, I have links to uh, forums where he, uh, web forums where 20 years ago or so, where he was saying things like, you know, the lawful good hero, that's supposed to be the most upstanding, like Superman-esque, if you will, uh, you know, this paladin who's a holy warrior for justice. Um, when fighting something like an orc, the proper thing to do is to kill it or enslave it. That was the good hero supposed to do that. Because if you, you can enslave it and then like force them to be civilized, which of course, I mean, this is yuck, right? I mean, it's to put it in as unscholarly a sense as possible. Even though this is a fiction, right? It, it, it's still very off-putting that that is the way that this content was is, uh, was uh, conceived by this creator of it. Now, I'm happy to report that the that the creator, the people that are the stewards of Dungeons and Dragons now, are trying to make efforts to move it away from that bad. Content element, but there's still a lot of work to do. And these authors were pointing that out. Uh, and, you know, on a web a website called Dungeons and Dragons, D&D Beyond, which is a website where you can kind of create a Dungeons and Dragons character, and there's all kinds of articles and videos about the game. There were several uh, columns, one by Tristan Tarwater and one another by James Hake, where they talked about, like, look, this is kind of an issue that when you create a character in Dungeons and Dragons, you pick a race, and that just decides a whole bunch of stuff for you. Like, if you wanted to play an orc as a character, you can, but you have to take a penalty to your intelligence. Mm -hmm. And you are, half orcs, for example, have a trait called savage attacks, and they are menacing, right? By birth, right? This isn't something that they gain when they grow up. It's simply because they have an orc parent. They are naturally savage and menacing. Which, you know, some people encounter that, you know, some people think, yeah, it's just a game, it doesn't matter. But the problem is that many people see that and see it just taking for granted about a whole race of people, not just some orcs, all orcs uh, are savage and menacing. And it reminds them, as Jemison pointed out, huh, sounds familiar. It reminds them of real world racist ideologies, explicit or implicit that they've encountered. And that kind of sours the experience for them, right? It's, it's off-putting, it's exclusionary, it's uncomfortable. And so, Tarwater and Hake tried to take the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. Because remember, Dungeons and Dragons isn't just uh, fantasy stories. It's not just fiction. It's a game with rules. And these rules dictate that you have these traits if you choose to play an orc, right? Um, and they said, well, can we make the rules avoid that kind of dis distasteful stuff or that stuff that is off-putting for some players or some prospective players? Uh, and so they tried to do it, and, and the people made different proposals. But as a reader, you know, I was thinking all of these proposals are kind of clunky and don't feel like Dungeons and Dragons. So some one, you know, there's a, a one on the Dungeon DM's Guild called Grazalak's Guide to Ancestry, and it's a great um, 
you know, it's a great option, but it's basically like, here's a bank of points. You can spend them to like add a menu and it's, it's quite complex and it just doesn't feel very much at all like what it is to create a character in Dungeons and Dragons, right? In Dungeons and Dragons, you, the first thing you do is you pick your race, then you pick your class, and then you decide your, your scores. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And you know, the, the race categories are like elf, orc, halfling, a human, uh, you know, gnome, dwarf. And, uh, but this was this kind of complex point system where you're having to figure things have variable weights. And again, if you want to really customize your character, great, that's a great way to do it. And if, if that book is the solution for some people, but it wasn't for me. So I came up with a set of rules and that I thought would be more fun. It felt like Dungeons and Dragons, but avoided this problem that a lot of people have been discussing. And what I had seen is that most of the people talking about it, I don't know, I, I don't know, I think a lot of people knew uh, what was the problem, but for me, I think the, the core of the issue for most people was that it was racial essentialism. So bioessentialism is the, is the view or the, the idea that you have the traits you have simply because of your biology, your race specifically. And so this means not, and of course you might think, well, right, some traits are, I mean, aren't, don't we do have some inherited traits, right? Like the fact that I have certain hair color or that my, I have a certain amount of melanin or whatever, these things have something to do with who my parents are, certainly, yes, granted. But that's not the view. The view is not that there are heritable traits in Dungeons and Dragons. That's not problematic. It's problematic when you think that all members of a race have, one, have a trait. And the fact of the matter is that just doesn't match up in the real world. The only place where people really argue strongly for that, that like all members of that race are better athletes or are better at math or are taller or are smarter or are whatever, prone to violence. That type of talk is really only found in kind of problematic or overtly racist uh, contexts. So, but that's how d d handles race. And so some people are, can we, what would it look like to tell these same stories just without the reproducing the same tropes and mechanics and ideas and ideologies that we don't like in the real world. So why would we want to reproduce them in our fictional fun, our game worlds, right? Uh, we don't have to. Now you might want to in order to explore them and critique them, fine. Nobody's saying you can't do this, but having it baked in as the default, you can't play D&D &D unless you do it this way, uh, some people find really problematic. And so I, uh, wanted to try to come up with a way to play the game which uh, without that stuff. So I, I wrote up uh, rules and showed them for some friends. And then one of them, Ed Silver, thank you, Ed, said, oh, this is great. You should put, publish this. This is so good. This solves the problem or whatever. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll put it on this drive through RPG website where people sell PDFs of game role-playing and tabletop game content. And, uh, but then I found that there was this program called Zine Quest, which is hosted by Kickstarter. And uh, it is an opportunity to uh, publish a zine uh, at a low bar of entry, small budget, simple, just black and white or whatever. Uh, so I did it and I put a budget of $300 so that I could, uh, you know, buy a cover, piece of art from the cover. And it's funded in 40 minutes. And by the end of its two weeks, it had a thousand, almost a thousand backers. So it kind of really blew up on me. Like, whoa, what the, didn't expect that. Cause it, this was in February, right? So it really tapped a kind of need in the community. And so then I kind of had all this extra money. So we bought nicer art and added some adventures and kind of did a supplement and all this stuff. And then when it came out in June, uh, it came out, it coincidence, it's, it came out when we got the proofs back after it, we had submitted them several weeks before. It came out like right in the middle of early June. Uh, so right around the time when the, uh, a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests were happening. And a lot of people were having very explicit conversations about race in fantasy gaming and Dungeons and Dragons in particular. And there was, it, I mean, it debuted on the day that the Black Lives Matter charity bundle started. So we put it in that. So we didn't you know, make any money on it for the first month or so because it was in this charity bundle, which is, I would prefer it that way. Um, so that was great. Uh, and, uh, but after that, after it came out of the bundle, this, it's just kind of exploded with sales. 
and a few people wrote, wrote articles on it, like in Polygon and Boing Boing and places like that. Uh, so it kind of blew up. And there was pushback, of course, but um, from some parties, some sections of the community. But by and large, it was very widely accepted. And uh, uh, people liked it, I think, because it. I had two design goals with it. I wanted to try to remove as much of the bioessentialism as I could, but still make it feel easy, kind of plug and play like the Dungeons and Dragons that people who are familiar with it or it, the, the fantasy tropes that you're familiar with are still there. Because the, the, the advantage of having fantasy tropes in your games and stories is that it's it's a shorthand. You uh, can use those as kind of hooks into the story because you know what an elf is supposed to be like or whatever, um, but to try and remove it. And this, the way we solved that problem, the way, the way I tried to come up with it is you say, well, look, the things that are problematic, it's not problematic to have traits be associated with being an orc or an elf. The problem is that it's when those traits are the ones that are often uh, used in real world kind of racist context, like the, everyone of that race is not as smart or as violent or as savage or as whatever. Those are the kinds of traits that really bother people when they are assigned to your race. And if you look at the D&D traits, the abilities that are assigned by Dungeons and Dragons, it's actually rather surprising uh, how many of them are the kinds of things that don't really belong in being assigned to race at all because they're things like your language, right? I mean, wh why is it that being born of, uh, of uh, you know, a dwarf makes you no dwarvish? That's odd, right? So just to give you an example, so if you were born of, I'm gonna do another screen share here. If you were born of, there it is, of an orc parent, you are naturally stronger than uh, other people. You have a tendency towards chaos and are not strongly inclined towards good. Uh, you are menacing and you make savage attacks and you can speak orc, the language of orc. So I thought that's odd right? Why are these assigned to your biology? Language? Uh, if, if I look at elf or dwarf, you find that elves have weapon uh, tool proficiencies and weapon proficiencies. Elves have weapon proficiencies and dwarves, depending on what dwarf you get, might have a tool proficiency. So dwarves are like born from the womb knowing how to be a smith, or elves are born from the womb knowing how to shoot a longbow. I mean, this is Silly, especially when it's not just things like that. It's also, are you smart or dumb, savage or menacing? So uh, I thought, well, look, why don't we just try and strip that, just like set that stuff aside and assign it to learned behavior? Because look, it's just common sense. If you look at this list, okay, fine. Your age, how long it is that half orcs live, that's going to be biological. Um, but alignment won't be. Alignment is your tendency, your behavior. That's not going to be biological, or I wouldn't want to assign it to biology uh, because it sounds racist. Um, how big you are, you know, is okay. This is going to be probably biological, and how fast you your basic speed is. That's only really a feature of whether you're, uh, you know, uh, a little person or a full size, you know, it's a very tall person or whatever. Um, those are kind of those seem biologically inherited. Uh, dark vision is whether your eyes can see well in the dark or not. That's not taught. But all the rest of this stuff, like languages and how you fight, you know, and whether you're uh, uh, intimidating or not, those are quite clearly learned behaviors. Those are taught cultural practices, norms. And so that's what we did. I said, oh, well, we'll just split it. And instead of making one choice for race, you make two. You choose ancestry, which is the uh, kind of your heritage, your uh, biological inherited traits, which will just be things like size and vision. If you're a dragonborn, you have a breath weapon. If you're an Arakokra, you have wings. If you're a triton, you can breathe underwater. Those are biological. Um, and most people aren't gonna look at the, if you're playing the fish man and say, oh, I see, you think all fish men can breathe underwater. Well, of course, why not? They're fish men. That's, that doesn't seem like a, a, the same kind of ideological justification. Uh, that we see in racist ideologies when we say all members of a certain ethnic group are inferior intellectually or violent or something. Fishmen have fish qualities. Okay, what's the problem? Birdmen have wings. No one, I don't think this is problematic form of bioessentialism because bioessentialism isn't fully 
always wrong. I mean, humans are have human DNA, and that means we have certain traits. We are generally, you know, typically have certain sort of biological features, like we can't see in the dark, for example. I don't think that's a problematic version of bioessentialism. It's the behavioral and cultural stuff that is problematic. So we put that in culture. So now when you're creating your character, you choose your ancestry and say, well, I'm going to be an elf. I'm going to live very long. I'm going to have, uh, you know, uh, I'll be able to see in the dark, whatever. But I, I, I learn if I live in an elf community or a community that's maybe you might say was, was traditionally culturally elven, I live in, uh, even though it might be full of non ancestral elves, it might be full of people of a variety of ancestries. Um, I learn elven language and elven weapons and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then, so that's what we did. And then we also kind of know there's no menacing or, 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 or savage at all. Like there's no culture that has savage attacks. We changed that the stuff that was overtly problematic. And, you know, so instead of being menacing, you're confident. Mm -hmm. Instead of having savage attacks, they're powerful, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to try and take that, because savage isn't a particularly problematic word to ascribe to a whole race of people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we did. And that, and that ended up being this here. Uh, this is Ancestry and Culture and Alternative to Race in 5th edition. Now, um, cover art's by uh, Bad Moon Art. And that's one of the things we wanted to do. And this is exactly what I used to do in my home games is just challenge tropes. So the queen here, the monarch or whoever this is, is uh, uh, looks, she, uh, she's supposed to be of Elvish and Orcish, uh, Elven and Orcish ancestry, right? So, um, and that one of the things I really wanted to emphasize as well is that in a fantasy world, where people, communities of elves, orcs, halflings, dwarves, and all these other gnomes might be intermixing, living side by side, you're going to have people that are, have, you know, of uh, more than one ancestry or of ancestries of a variety of sorts. So on the left, we've got a, someone that is a halfling uh, and tiefling ancestry. The person kneeling is dwarven and gnomish ancestry. Person on the right is just a dwarven ancestry, I believe. And uh, so we tried to represent the concepts and the, the ideal, ideals of the set of rules in the art too. Um, and then generally we, I walked through the uh, various uh, basic uh, races that are found in the player's handbook and uh, that are released publicly under the open gaming license. And I just split them in exactly the ways I've been describing. So, you know, the orc is, gets age, size, speed, dark vision. Uh, these are our ancestral traits and then cultural traits are things like confident attacks or powerful attacks. and you, you learn the Orcish language and so on, right? That's a dwarf and person of dwarf and Orcish heritage there, ancestry, and so on. So yeah, this is a gnome and human uh, person and so on and so forth. Uh, there's an Orc halfling. Um, and so that's what we did. But, uh, and I think a lot of people appreciated that because A, it I'd like to think it removes the worst part of the way in which Dungeons and Dragons uses race, uh, this kind of the, the problematic elements of the bioessentialism. Uh, it does leave some in there, uh, you know, elves still see in the dark and things like that and live longer than humans. But I don't think that's as problematic. And when I talk to people, they don't report that bothering them. Um, and so that's, it's, so we hope it removes that distasteful element, but it's also really familiar because you look at that and you're like, well, what kind of creature do I want to be? Orc, elf, dwarf. And then you say, well, where do I want to grow up? Among orcs, elves, and dwarves? Or it's among some other kind of culture. And so now for the first time, uh, it's there's a built into the mechanics of fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons in this version that I've produced. You get, um, you can make, a, if you know your Tolkien, you can get make Aragorn, a human, but that's raised in an elvish culture. Uh, and so because he's raised elven, he knows different languages, he has other skills, he can, he knows some elven healing techniques and things like this. Um, that's, can't, you can't, it's not, you have to kind of homebrew that if you want to play it in d d Now to give Dungeons and Dragons credit, Jeremy Crawford, the lead rules designer, and many other people, it's in the player's handbook from day one, have said, you can change the rules to make them as you like. So it's not that they have said, don't you dare change these rules to, of, to remove this stuff. They've allowed that people do that. Um, the uh, problem is that it's been baked in as this is the default. And a lot of players say, look, if it's not written in the book, then it's not something we're going to do. Or if you want to play in the Adventurers League, which is the official kind of um, public uh, uh, gaming, if you want to play D&D like at a game store and make a character that you can then take to other places at conventions and so on, organized play, it's called. 
um, they have to follow the book rules, right? So uh, that was the kind of ideal there. Uh, so, but I, so I, we put those rules in and people say, they report, oh, this is just super easy to pick up and play. It's like a plug and play solution to this problem. And it mostly uh, removes this specific issue of racial essentialism, the, the distasteful part of race in D&D. &D. But again, I do want to point out that this is, so if you look at, I begin with an essay, just two pages that explains this type of stuff. Why replace ancestry and culture with, with a race? And so I've got a couple, uh, just a few, I've already shouted out a few of these, um, but just to uh, be clear on it. Um, so, you know, I, I, there's an article that links here to uh, the uh, uh, report, a uh, scientific report that in fact, scientists, the consensus among genetics, geneticists is that there aren't phenotypic traits like, you know, skin color and facial structure and all sorts of things like that, that cleanly map onto that members, all members of, of one race have and non-members don't. In fact, the variety among uh, inside of a category of race is actually larger very often than the variety between two quote unquote races. Now that doesn't mean races uh, entirely doesn't exist. Uh, it, what, the way I like to think of it is that race is like nationality, not like eye color. It's real, like it's true that I really I have American citizenship, but it's not like that's baked into my biology. It's more a, a factor. I mean, it, it is because my parents were American, but it's still a social construct of a sort, right? It's a fact of the world, but it's something that we kind of um, agree to say, to call people American or not. And you see this, if you look at different cultures, how they describe people, for example, as being black or white, right? So I've been told that like a, one, I've got a Brazilian friend who reports that, for example, when he is in America, people think he's black, but when he goes to Brazil, he people think, call, you know, refer to him as white uh, or, you know, and that sort of thing. So these are the lines of these categories uh, change from place to place and time to time as well. Um, and that's what this suggests. Now, if you're interested in that sort of philosophical debate about, well, does that mean race doesn't exist or it's only a construct or it's only a, it's only a social reality? I would invite you to look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is, I might add, the best source for philosophical encyclopedia info, much better than Wikipedia. And uh, it has a great breakdown of this here. And philosophers and race theorists disagree about how exactly we should uh, discuss this, but they all agree that things like behavior and, you know, intelligence just don't map cleanly onto race. That's a consensus. Uh, so, uh, so that's why I thought this was necessary and what led me to want to create this content and uh, how it kind of came about. Now, since releasing it, uh, the, as I said, there's been kind of a big uh, it's been well received, um, and I'm glad about that. But uh, it, uh, uh, you know, it, it made it's called adamantine on Drive Through RPG, which means that it that's the highest level of sales that they report record. Uh, it's I think it's like point, I don't know, like less than one percent of all titles ever make it in their lifetime. And Drive Through's been around for like ten years, and so this made it in about four months, and that's. Only a few titles have made make it faster, and they're usually from famous people. Uh, so I'm I was delighted that it got that kind of uptake. And don't get me wrong, this was just one part in a large wave of of people raising these issues and publishing good content. There's a few other solutions out there, like there's one called An Elf and an Orc Have a Little Baby, and there's one called The Half Race Handbook. And uh, I've mentioned Gra Gravelax Guide already. So I mean, there's Gabe uh, Hicks has a great one where he assigns. Uh, attribute points to class instead of uh, race or culture or ancestry. So those are some great solutions as well. Uh, but all of us together, this community of people trying to address this issue, I think are, we've received a lot more a positive feedback than negative. And I think that's the future of gaming and uh, of Dungeons and Dragons in particular. And as a sign, around the time, shortly after, you know, I released this book, and I'm not saying there's no causal claim here, that this just happened to be in the zeitgeist. People were debating, discussing it. Wizards of the Coast released a statement saying that they were going to try and address and fix these issues. And they've, there's been a couple places where they've fixed a few small things, like they improved the representation of the Vistani, which are kind of an obvious stand-in for real world Romani people. Um, and they improved the representation of that. And then they released uh, 
some one thing, and I'll end. I'll end here on in a moment. Here, I'm wrapping up. They end. They released some rules in a book called Tasha's uh, Cauldron of Everything. This just came out a month ago, and in it, they had been uh, promoting this as their big like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna address that problem, right? We are going to. We've got a solution in, in the works. They said in June, uh, and then this comes out, and you know, it's. it's I think some people were disappointed because it's it's basically just a page long. And it basically says, take the any of those rules I made, you know, I mentioned earlier, like how an orc has plus two to strength or an orc, you know, a half orc has plus two to strength and a full orc has minus two to intelligence or whatever. And just, you don't have to do those. Put, it, put those points wherever you like. And if you don't want to have a skill in smithing tools, you can choose or a tool or, or, or longbow or you, or you don't want to speak the Elvish language, you can just choose another language or another skill with your GM's permission, the end. So they gave you the, that was it. And so they give you the option. They let you know what they've already said in the beginning in 2014 in the player's handbook. Hey, if you don't like the way these characters are statted out, you can just change them with your GM's permission. So they kind of just repeated that and emphasized it, which I mean, I suppose is good to say, and it is good to uh, give players more options, but they very clearly made it optional uh, it's not part of the core of the game. They're not instituting it as required or anything. And they uh, put, they presented it as, we want to give you more choices. We want player choice is what this is all about. Make the character you want. So there's no mention of race as problematic or as like, look, it's better if we recognize that people, like members of sentient peoples are not always going to be savage or whatever. Um, in fact, that's not a trait we should ascribe to race at all. So there's really no mention there. Now, hopefully in the coming years, they'll fix those things more explicitly, but the stuff is baked pretty far into the core of the game. So uh, I don't know what the future holds for us in that regard, but I hope that this book and the work group we've continued to do since then uh, helps advance that conversation. Um, so thank you for allowing me to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I think we have Q and A. Should I field questions, or Tatiana, will you handle those? Uh, you can field the questions. I believe they are directed towards you. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I have mentioned, uh, I have put a link to your pre uh, your uh, Arcanist Press in the web chat. Um, I know not all of you are going to be able to get this from Chicago Public Library because you may not live in the city of Chicago, but we still want you to check it out. All right. Tatiana, so, uh, um, can you please read out the questions to Eugene so we have it on transcripts and stuff? All right. Wonderful. Yes. Um, first question is, um, I'm only going to use your first name, uh, Wilson. Uh, thank you for all the work you've done on this. I have a question about something you mentioned earlier regarding exploring challenging bioessentialism in a specific game or art. I've been toying with this idea in my homebrew game as I think it's an easy way to encourage players to talk about moral decision-making. But I am curious if you have heard about any best practices or possible pitfalls in games handling that kind of challenging material. Uh, that's a great, important question. So anytime I would recommend on, this is my take on it, anytime you want to encounter or uh, you, uh, think there might be material that could qualify as challenging coming up. Um, or maybe uh, you intentionally want to encounter or present that. I always would recommend uh, checking in with your players, fellow players first, whether it's at the beginning of a campaign or arc where you do kind of a session zero, uh, or you just set, step aside bef out before the game and have a conversation. Uh, and if you want tips on specific ways to handle that best practices, the best uh, solution, uh, two documents I would recommend are the TTRPG safety tools, safety toolkit. Uh, and uh, it just won the NE, which is like the role-playing game version of, uh, uh, you know, the Emmys or Oscars or whatever. Uh, and that has a series of kind of techniques you can use uh, in order to, uh, have conversations with your fellow player or set uh, boundaries. Uh, you know, one of them, for example, is you, before you start inter introducing any 
problematic content, or really before you start role playing at all, you kind of check in with your players and and or, or your GM or whatever, and say like, is there anything that we don't want to have, like that we want it just not occurring in the game at all? Let's draw a line there. Or do we want things that we're okay with them happening, but not like explicitly on screen, so to speak, put a veil, put that behind a veil, right? So this is kind of another way of talking about it, as you might think about it as like a rating system. Um, and, you know, some people get their hackles up about this sort of thing. Thank you, Tatiana. Yeah, the, uh, it, it's, it's a great resource. Um, a second one is Consent in Gaming from Monty Cook Press. I think it's free and it covers a lot of the same ground, but it has this cool a consent check checklist, which is like a bunch of topics that sometimes people uh, like or don't like. And then it's like, yes, please. I don't care. Uh, no, or, you know, let's put this behind a veil or not at all. You know, like it can happen, but off screen, or I don't even want that on the table. And so those are the two best sources for, for that sort of thing. And I would highly recommend uh, using them. Uh, even when you don't think uh, content's gonna be, oh, I'm not getting into any problematic stuff because you don't know what other people might find problematic. I know the first 30 years of my gaming life, I just wasn't aware. I was clueless about how race might bother uh, others. So I'd recommend those, they're great. Uh, all right. Thank you, uh, Wilson, for that great question. Uh, next is from Kyle. Uh, thank you for hosting this needed discussion. I see how your structure makes it easy for players to create the characters they want and even creates assumptions about the world at character creation. E.g. D&D races can be raised in different cultures. Therefore, a lot of cities, nations, the party might visit, they'll expect are not monolithic. If you are a DM, how do, you, how do these concepts affect how you think about and create story arcs? How do you deal with good versus evil in character decision making? How do you deal with the inherent permission to use violence that is rooted in D&D? Yeah, these are good questions too. So I'll start, there's a couple. So very briefly, uh, the way in which this has affected my uh, DMing, if you will, uh, is that I, uh, it allows me to treat characters more like people, individuals, than to stand-ins for a stereotype, right? So because you're in a, an environment where you just don't know whether the person that seems to be, uh, have orcish ancestry, you don't know whether they're automatically going to be uh, good or evil, right? You just have to, you have to treat them like an individual. Uh, that actually makes it for richer, especially as you describe in like an urban or diverse sort of world or environment, it can be quite interesting. Uh, but this is a game that, uh, you know, kind of promotes, if you will, solving problems with violence. And I, and there's plenty of us who have played these games and had gone whole sessions or whole whatever's uh, many weeks without drawing a weapon or blood or anything. Great. But if you look at the rules, 90% of the rules are about how to adjudicate what happens when violence occurs. I mean, that's just what the rules are mostly about. Because it was based on a war game. That's what it was originally based on. Um, so I will admit that this, the way I'm uh, trying to present ancestry and culture here doesn't address other issues in the game. So the fact that violence is so often seen as a solution to problems that don't need violence necessarily, that's uh, part of not just the rules, but the culture around D&D very often. There are plenty of people that don't play that way, but it's true. If that's something that's a problem, this won't solve it. Uh, another one is that it's, it's still colonialist in many ways because a lot of the ways the rules are set up is you are saviors that go to other cultures and either save them from problems they're having or you raid their dungeons and tombs and take their valuables. So that is a way that's traditionally run. Now you don't have to run it that way, but a lot of the, even the fifth edition published adventures have a lot of that going on. Uh, you know, so those are some problems I can't solve there. But there was one final question. Um, oh, I got deleted. I don't remember what, there was three questions out of there. Uh, I will uh, say that, I'm sorry? Yes, for the third question. Yeah, what was it? Um, hi there, thank you so much for sharing. Oh. I am a third year senior in undergrad doing a website on uh, by POC representation in various uh, RPGs. Uh, there's a website there that I'm going to share with uh, the panelists and would love to hear further discussions. I have two questions so far. How would you uh, discuss the idea of different genasi? And two, 
Will you write a second book to discuss the other races, Janazi, Firbolg, Azimir, etc.? Well, it's funny you should ask because uh, I, I did not intend this to be, uh, you know, uh, me promoting our stuff. But very quickly, I'll show you this. Um, so we have uh, multiple titles. So down here in the row here, you can see there's Ancestry and Culture. And then the next two are Custom Ancestries and Cultures and More Ancestries and Cultures. Uh, those have something like 120 other races broken down into Ancestry and Culture. Now, because of the way D&D and Wizards of the Coast handles copyright, I couldn't just take Genasi straight out of the book and present it or any of the other races that aren't uh, released under the open gaming license. Wizards of the Coast lets third-party creators like ourselves uh, use a narrow range of their core content in our products um, without paying them any royalties. And uh, I used all of those. Uh, but then I created original races that are quite obviously homages or inspired by the other races in the game so that I cover every published race uh, or a version of it. So instead of wood elf, we have forest elf. Instead of forest gnome, we have wood gnome and that sort of thing. Um, we have genasi, but what we do is we split it into four. Uh, because in D&D, the Genasi are humans that have some uh, heritage of either uh, some sort of like a genie or uh, an Afriti, or, and then there's, those are air and fire, and then there's one for earth and one for water, the Dal and the Merid. And those are inspired by kind of, uh, you know, uh, Arab uh, mythology and culture. Uh, and uh, so these are humans with that kind of ancestry. So I just made it for ancestries. And so there's, you can see, these are the traits that are heritable. And then these are cultural traits, right? Uh, is how I solved that problem. And that same thing with, there are several others that we did that with that uh, were kind of very complicated. And it looked initially like, well, gosh, almost all the traits are just biological. So we had to kind of, uh, so we split them up that way. That solved that problem. Um, um, and uh Thank you, Kat, for that question. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, this is the final question. Uh, does your book support the creation of NPCs? Unrelated, what would be a good item for longstanding, widespread feuds to be based upon, continent-wide? Uh, oh, right. I did remember there was a second part to the previous question that I didn't want to skip, which is what about like good and evil and stuff, right? So this reminds me of the widespread feud issue, right? Uh, reminded me of this. So I do want to say that you might, some people have worried, well, gosh, if orcs aren't the bad guys, how can you play d and I mean, so two things. There's one is like, uh, well, have you ever watched uh, a movie or read a book where there is conflict? 90% of the time, the conflict is with the, uh, uh, the antagonist is not simply because the antagonist is a member of a race. It's because they're a bad person, right? So if you want to have villains in your D&D story, they can even be orcs, but they're not villains simply because of their orcish ancestry or biology. They're villains because they're choosing to harm people, right? Uh, or whatever. So it's not hard. You can, your stories don't have to change radically. Uh, it's just that they're, they're evil because of, if you need to have good and evil in your game, that they're evil because of the choices they're making, not because of their, their parents. Right? Or who their, their their ancestry is. Problem solved. But if you really, really do need uh, kind of evil groups, uh, then I would advise using devils and demons and fiends and undead, right? So these rules are assuming we're talking about kind of like sentient creatures that live on the material plane, you know, that you would encounter normally, not demons. Right. Although, to be fair, you could use these rules, and there are a couple of the races in the expansion books that are basically like, play a demon person or an angelic person or whatever. And yeah, you can be whatever alignment or traits you like. But I think if you're going to make a group of people uniformly good or uniformly evil, the only way that I think anybody finds it even remotely acceptable who's thinking about this issue is, okay, fine. I guess, I mean, make all undead evil, fine. Zombies are just are bad people, or they're just they're just not um, they're not good or something. Uh, so I, I, that's that's how I would use these rules to still have many of the same conflicts. Which goes to answering the second question here uh, at the end, or the last part of the second, the, the, our final question here: How do long-standing, widespread feuds, continent-wide? I mean, again, um, 
I believe it was, you know, uh, you know, there's nothing weirder than the real world and, the, and nothing better to base your stories on. And what I mean by that is look at our own history. There have been long standing centuries, millennia long uh, antagonisms, feuds, continent wide at times. And it's not just because of race. Now, the funny thing is sometimes it gets depicted that way, right? So the stories that people tell on each side might have racism in them. And in your game, I'm not saying that people can't have racists show up or have racist beliefs. It's that I think that A, it's good to talk to your fellow players before introducing that sort of content and check in with them. And B, uh, you don't need to go to that kind of simplistic trope. Uh, it can be because someone wronged someone else and there was familial ties on each side and those people backed up their member of the family instead of the other person. And this led to a long history of, of conflict or it could be an economic reason to two different uh, groups are competing for a scarce resource. I mean, that's, uh, that's a pretty easy way to do it. Now the book to ask the for answer, the first part of that final question does have I mean, there the are rules for uh, creating not just your standard player characters, but also characters of mixed ancestry and also diverse culture and also entirely customizable. Uh, so there's, those are in the appendixes at the end. So there's all kinds of ways to make different characters. I don't have specific guidance in here for creating like NPC stat blocks, but uh, it's quite easy to just, um, the thing that's amazing is you can actually, it's almost just like making a regular character. You just choose twice. And when you choose the rate, the ancestral, that gives them more certain ancestry traits. And when you choose culture, that gives them their cultural traits. And so the stat blocks will look almost the same, except instead of race up there, it'll just have two options instead of one. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think that answers that. Thank you, Eugene. You've given me so many great ideas for uh, my games, um, especially with, uh, with uh, tomb looting. Uh, I might flip the script on that one and actually try to preserve, you know, someone's tomb if they're trying to loot it from, you know, adventurers and stuff like that. I think that'd be f quite fun. Um, anyway, thank you again, Eugene and Arcanus Press. You can go to their website. It's linked uh, below. Uh, and you can, uh, coming soon to Chicago Public Library, we're going to have this own module so you can take a look at it, check it out. Um, and, you know, if you, and you can also purchase it from their website. Now, um, before we head out, I wanna mention a few games programming that's uh, that's coming up. So this uh, this Tuesday, December 15th, there's an interest, uh, there's a Pathfinder intro session where game masters, uh, those people who run games can learn how to play Pathfinder. And then this Thursday at 6 p.m., Dungeons, Dice, and Everything Nice, local podcasters are doing a live library Dungeons and Dragons adventure for us. This is the third year we've been working with them, and we hope to see you all at future game events. Um, now, Eugene, do you have any final words? Um, I would, uh, uh, so there's a question, just, I believe, yes, this will be viewable uh, uh, on YouTube in the future, but uh, I will say that, look, I am appreciate, I appreciate the way in which the community has embraced this title, and uh, uh, that's been very heartwarming. Uh, I think it really just goes to show that there is, uh, a, you know, a, a need for this, and it's heartening to me to see people uh, wanting to address these sorts of issues, but to be clear, yes, I you know I came up with some mechanics and put this together in this book, but the people that really, like, please, if this is something you're interested in, go and look at those people I referenced before. Go and look at, you know, um, James Mendes Hodes and Green Barber and the things that the Asians Represent podcast is doing to uh, talk about uh, representation uh, in uh, D&D. And uh, they're, you know, they're the ones doing, uh, really doing the, the bulk of the work. And I'm, I learned from them. And I, let's face it, I've not been gatekeeped and marginalized and excluded in the way they have. You know, when I say this stuff on the internet, which I've been saying pretty regularly for a year now, um, I, okay, I had a, a you know, a, I did get attacked by a, a, a Russian Gamergate Twitch channel, but mostly people just said, oh, I just, you, that's lame or whatever. And then would leave, that would, it would be it. But you know, 
when Asians represent criticizes you know their old the old first edition D&D book Oriental Adventures I mean they get like death threats and all kinds of racist attacks and stuff uh, so I mean yes of course I appreciate appreciate the attention and the credit because I like games and want to keep contributing to the community but you know Gabe Hicks and Daniel Kwan and those are the people that are deserve uh, more attention so please go check them out thank you Thank you.